So we've all as kids played with uh, this little magnifying glass that is at home. So you take it and put it under the sun. You will probably notice that you know you keep it at the right distance from a piece of paper. You can end up burning the piece of paper. If you haven't done this, it's about time you try. Right? It's fascinating, right? All of a sudden, just by using a piece of glass, you're able to create fire. Now, what exactly are we doing here? Now, you might have heard your parents or someone say, "All of the sun's light, along which means also its heat, is getting focused onto a point, and therefore the paper starts to burn." Now, what is that word we used here? Focus. We already used this in mirrors, and we kind of told you that we will explain this in a very deep manner. So, whenever we have what's called a focusing system, what's really happening? Lots of rays are getting focused on to one single point. Now, let us see if we can try and explain this in a way that probably you wouldn't see anywhere else. Let's ask this question: What is the only thing we know about light? Between two points, it will take the quickest path. Great. So, if there is only one quickest path, what will light do? It will take only that path. So how can we make from one point to another point lots of rays that leave have to come back again over here and what does it mean when that happens we say that the image of this this point is this point that's what we say right what is an image rays starting from a point meet again at a different point then the second point is the image of the first point but how do we do this how do i make that make it so that many rays are going to meet again what is the from our fermat's principle of least time what should this mean If all these rays are meeting again, and if let's say one of those paths is quicker than all the other paths, what would happen? Would light take any of the other paths? It wouldn't, right? It would just take that one path that is really, really quick. But if if light is taking all those paths, what does it mean? It means that the only possibility is that all those paths have equal times that which which light takes. So what are we trying to say here? Any time I want to focus light onto a point from another point. I have to create paths that all take equal time for light to flow. Makes pretty much good amount of sense. So, what is the only principle we're using here as well? The Fermat's principle of least time or lights in a hurry. So, if you understand this, what does it really mean? Any time you see light rays meeting at a particular point, it is because all the rays that travel from their source took the same amount of time. Because if they did not, all of them would have taken the point of shortest time or the path of shortest time. So having said this, let's see if we can apply this to our little game that we played, right? Yeah. With a magnifying lens. We all know how a magnifying lens looks, lens looks, but let's try to derive it if possible. So let's take a set of parallel rays, right? Let's say a set of five parallel rays are coming here, and I want to focus them all onto a point over here. Now I know that the ray over here has to travel a long distance to meet here, right? If I don't do anything, will it go meet there? So it's going to continue straight, right? I need to make it go towards it, right? The other ray over here, I need to make it go Towards here, I need to do this. So, what do I start to do? I need to start to construct a way in which I can slow down the the starting ray, the middle ray, so much that by the time it reaches that point, even the top ray will reach. So, what am I trying to do? I need to make I, I add a thick glass slab over here. What does a glass slab do? It will slow down the light. So great, slows down for a long time and then goes and reaches there. But can I slow all the rays down equally? No, right. This light has to travel. A long distance, so I slow down very, very little, or almost nothing. So it goes and reaches there. I create one more slightly thicker glass slab over here. So this is going to slow down a little bit more, and then it reaches there, and so on. And what is the kind of shape that you form? Very little reduction of speed, slightly more, slightly more, large reduction of speed, and then symmetrically on the other side. So you get a shape that looks pretty familiar, right? Now let me point out something. This is a very, very uncommon way of saying this. There is another way which we'll look at immediately. But if you understand this, what have we done? We've created for all those five rays paths that take equal time for them to reach here. Therefore, they reach there, right? Another common way of looking at this, if you did not or were not comfortable with the old one, is very simple. Imagine this lens to be made up of a set of prisms and one glass slab in the middle. So we know that a prism is going to bend light towards its base. So that does it that way. The next prism does it a little lesser. The glass slab doesn't bend at all, straight at it, and opposite that way. So we've created a focusing system by using a set of Prisms put together in what we call a lens, right? And this particular lens is called a convex lens because it's a focusing lens, it's a converging lens, and it does this. So you have two ways of understanding this now: either as a set of prisms or by just using Fermat's principle of least time or lights in a hurry. Having done this, right? Let's try and understand how far away this point is going to be, right? That length, that point is called the focus. We know that, and this length is called the focal length. Let's begin to see how we can play with this and try to expand this idea even more. So now that we have gone through the very unconventional approach, where we understand that focusing really is about 
taking parts of equal time let's go for a very more chilled out very simple approach that most of your school will talk about which is pretty much let's take a thin convex lens ha huh. finally some familiar territory so take a thin convex lens why should it be thin first question right we'll tell you yeah it's a good assumption to make because if it is not thin there are certain assumptions that we make which will not work we'll tell you that right so by thin we also mean that this convex lens has been cut out of two big circles so you take really two large circles make them intersect very very little then you take that part that intersects fill it up with glass and remove all the circles what do you have it's a very very thin convex lens now what we will do is kind of understand how this convex lens what this convex lens does to light right without trying to memorize anything we we'll just understand this by pure logic so let's take the convex lens in front of us it's thin we'll tell you what what we mean by thin let's take a ray that's going parallelly to its axis so the same um conventions that we kept for our mirrors hold here there is a principal axis the center part or the symmetric center of this lens is called the pole right and the pole every every convex lens has a focus and a focal length so great with this in mind let's take a ray that is going parallel to the principal axis which is called a paraxial ray which is close to the principal axis and also parallel to it now what do we know about this ray from our previous discussion it will get focused on to a point called the focus and in order to go into it a little more deeper let's zoom into this picture such that you see the ray hitting the interface of air to glass and we know what happens here right rarer to denser draw the normal there it will bend towards the normal great now as it goes there now it has to leave glass and enter air that is denser to rarer draw the normal again it goes and bends away from the normal so cleanly you understand why this ray is going to bend that way and you do the exact opposite on the other side you know it's going to bend upwards so finally all these rays are going to reach the center right so let's take one ray which is a parallel ray so we prove that any parallel ray is going to get focused on is going to pass through that point called the focus great how many rays do we need to figure out one point just two rays right so all we're looking for right now amongst these thousands of rays is just one more ray and which ray shall we take that ray that passes through the pole of this lens now what's interesting about the pole right there's a prism there's a prism there's a glass slab prism prism so the pole the part of the pole can be approximated to be just a glass slab the lens doesn't matter it acts just like a glass slab and what does a glass slab do it does not bend light at all just like we saw it only moves it shifts it around a little bit and here is where our assumption comes in really handy what if it's a really thin lens so in other words if the glass slab is really 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 thin yeah we can assume that the deviation it creates is negligible right so here the assumption would mean that the ray that comes and passes through the pole and that glass slab that can be is that's over there it goes unaffected and that's it we're done we have our two rays one ray the ray that's parallel will pass through the focus second the ray that's passing through the pole will pass around unaffected and for that to be true it has to be a thin lens so we also understand why our assumption has to be true here and we have our two rays now what's left to do begin to play right take a convex lens keep it where we want to keep it keep an object so you have your f which is your focus let's double the focus keep a point called 2f right same thing on the other side and let's really begin to see what happens so let's move this around here and have it in a setup which is very comfortable and let's start to see what happens to our first ray goes through the goes parallel goes through the focus great what is the other ray goes through the pole and where does the image form that's right if i keep the object beyond 2f like we did here it forms between f and 2f great So are we going to be like really, really meticulous? Calculate for if I keep it between f and two f, if I keep it before f, if I keep it instead of doing that, let's try and see if we can add some more value to it. Because we're all human beings, we can probably think in a way that's more beautiful than just mundane. So let's see what happens by applying the rule called or the idea that we have that light has the rule of reciprocity, right? Whatever light does in one direction, if you reverse it, it'll do in the other direction as well. So instead of the object here, if I keep the object where the image was, then the image must be where the object was. if that was a little bit like a tongue twister let me tell you what i mean all i mean is if the object beyond 2f forms an image between f and 2f then the object between f and 2f must form an image over here in other words if i turn this diagram around like that would it make a difference right light follows the rule of reciprocity so just by taking one example you already understood what will happen if you keep the object at both between f and 2f and beyond 2f now this also means that if i keep it exactly at 2f where is the only possibility for it to form That's right. Exactly at two of again with the same size. So we can continue to do this. We can keep the object in different places and start playing with it. And all you need is a scale, maybe if you're not very, very keen at you know very, very good at drawing. So you need a scale and maybe a pencil, and you can start doing this, right? And you can find out where the image will be formed for any object, and you can continue to do this. And we also have a sign convention that we saw, 
which we will talk about when we talk about deriving the lens formula, like we did the mirror formula. So the sign convention remains the same. What was that? Right positive, up positive, left negative, and down negative. So having understood this, having seen all these images being formed beyond to f, between f and to f, before f, and all of these, what do you infer? That a convex lens can form both real and virtual images. Yeah, as long as the object is beyond f, right? In other words, it's after f, it's going to form a real image, right? And if you keep the object very, very, very far away, it forms a highly diminished image at the focus. Does that strike a bell? That is what you were doing when you took sun's rays and focused them on to the ground, because all of sun's rays are, where is the object? Sun is so far away, it can be taken to be at infinity. So the parallel rays coming in, all of them get focused onto the focus. And that's where if you keep the paper right at the focus, what happens? The paper begins to burn. Because sun's light not only contains light energy, it also contains some heat energy. If you want to go slightly deeper into it, what is heat energy? All the electromagnetic waves in the infrared spectrum, we feel as heat, right? So it's all in electromagnetic waves, like we said. Light, in one sense, is an electromagnetic wave, which you will learn about later. And as long as the electromagnetic wave is between a particular set of wavelengths, we call it visible light, we can see it. We can't see other wavelengths of light. The later wavelengths, called the infrared, in other words, the wavelength is larger than red, we call them infrared, and they are what we feel as heat. So if the paper is burning, you kind of have to understand that it's all an expression of the same thing. So we've done a little bit of good work here, and now let's jump on to understanding how we can kind of predict stuff about where the image will be formed, just like we did in mirrors, even without our pencil and scale. So let's go ahead and do that. We kind of took a very, very common lens and played with it. Let's take a slightly more uncommon lens, right? We have a converging lens or a convex lens, which is what we saw. What if I make it exactly the opposite? So the first, instead of keeping the prism that way, I invert it, right? And then I keep doing that, and I keep a glass slab in the middle again, and then I keep inverting it again. What would that look like? A lens that looks like that, which is called a concave lens, or a diverging lens. Now, why is it called a diverging lens? Because it's pretty much going to diverge all the parallel rays that come into a larger and broader area. So let's see why this should happen. Let's take our old analogy. Let's take a one, a one ray of light. It hits the lens at that point, and look what happens. Draw the normal, light is entering from rarer to denser, therefore it will bend towards the normal. Great, it's already gone a little bit up. Now it's going to go from glass into air, denser to rarer, therefore away from the normal. Does that again. What happens to light? Comes this way and starts going away. Now if I carefully construct this concave lens in a way that all those divergent rays seem to be coming from one particular point, then I can imagine that to be the focus, right? Do the lights really, do the rays of light really get focused onto that point? No, they don't. But they appear to be coming from that particular point. And what do I mean by that? If somebody stands there, right, they would get some 10 rays hitting their eyes. And what would their mind infer? They're all coming from that one point there. So it's an imaginary focus here, or it's a virtual focus. Done with that, right? So it's a divergent lens. A straight line is going to go diverging. What about a ray that's going through the pole? Should it make a difference? It's a glass slab there, it's a glass slab here. So the ray is just going to go unaffected. So with these two in mind, you can kind of calculate any place where the image forms, like we show you. So you're, going, you're showing a real quick picture of all the images formed when the objects are in particular places. So as you can see, what happens is that you keep the object wherever you want, you keep getting images that look like this. And clearly it's a diverging lens. Do you think it's going to create a real image? What do you need for a real image? All the rays have to meet again. Will that ever happen in this case? It just can't happen, right? Because it's a diverging lens. So all your images are going to be virtual. And if you want to go into it a little more deeper, all that Galileo did was try and take a convex lens, which gave some magnification, because we all know it's a magnifying glass. Right? We do know, of course, that you move too far away, you can't magnify very well. There is a particular range within which the convex lens magnifies, right? can be used as a magnifying glass. That was quite popular in Galileo's time. It was called a spy glass. And Galileo had a lot of glass-making friends. So he had also, he had seen this concave lens as well. And what he did was amazing because what he did is he took a convex lens and put a concave lens and tried to see through both of them because nobody did that till then. And that's what happens when you try to do something that nobody, it really occurred nobody, you know, no, it occurred to nobody to do that. And when he did that, he realized that normally a convex lens gives about two times magnification, maybe 2.5 times. You put this across, all of a sudden you get 10 times magnification. Why this happens? You can draw the diagrams or wait a couple of years. They'll teach you in 12th standard. I'm not supposed to say this, no? You can either draw the diagram or you can go find out wherever else you want to find out or wait a couple of years and they maybe they'll teach you, right? And so you look at these, those two and it's called a telescope. And that's how the first telescope was created. Take a convex lens, put a concave lens, adjust them to the point where you can see really large images. 
right? So we've done a little bit about convex lens and concave lens. It's about time we try and understand how to just mathematically predict it without just having to draw all this around. Yeah, let's do that. So now let's begin our journey into trying to understand how images form just by pure math. We already did this for mirrors. We call it the mirror formula. We use the sign convention. Let's just go through the sign convention once more. Right and up positive, left and down negative. What does that mean? Let's take a convex lens, and uh, the light is going to get focused onto a particular side. So if if in your if in your point of view, if light comes this way and gets focused that way, then the focus for the convex lens is positive, the focal length, right? And for a concave lens, what is it going to be? Yeah, it's going to diverge out from a point, but where is that point? It's on this side of the pole, right? So what is it going to be? It's going to be negative. So this is something fundamental I want you to understand. This is because of our convention. Are these lenses really negative? No, no, no. The negative sign before the length, the focal length of a concave lens, just tells that the concave lens has a focal length or a focus that is to the left of it, and and the convex lens has it to the right of it. Pretty simple, right? Yeah, it's just a convention. So similarly for mirrors as well, right? If you remember mirrors, and if you see a concave mirror has its focus to its left, therefore it will be a, it'll be negative, and a convex mirror has it to its right, therefore it'll be positive. So these are the four major things you have to remember about mirrors and lenses as far as the sign convention is concerned. Of course, all the distances are measured from the origin where the pole is. 